through all of our experience with media over time, we have learned to suspend disbelief. So it's not too much of a stretch to get into our heads and get us to suspend disbelief and actually start to believe something that if we were really thinking critically, we might not otherwise have believed. So the internet kind of becomes a real Petri dish, uh, especially in 2016. We've talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, a Petri dish for psyops and propaganda and manipulation of, of what people are thinking. And you have this whole fake news thing emerging and, and the idea of deep fakes where you can't necessarily believe even what you're seeing or what you think you're seeing. Uh, conspiracy theories and alternate realities. Uh, and the fringes are starting to gain on the mainstream, really, and they're starting to become more mainstream. This time on the Plutopia News Network podcast, Plutopia co-host and co-founder John Lubkowski asks, are we still questioning authority or have we lost all sense of an authority for truth? Speaking to a virtual meeting of EFF Austin, John explores the changes in online discourse. Our speaker is somebody with a very long, intimate, illustrious connection to EFF Austin, John Lipkowski. He is the only current member of the board that goes all the way back to the uh, founding of the organization. He served in various roles of co-founder, of president, of vice president, um, and board member of uh, all throughout our almost 30 year history, we would not be here without John's tireless work and advocacy. And we are happy that he still continues to give us a slice of his time when I'm sure he could think of a lot of other ways he could use his time. So we're very happy. I'm not sure it was completely tireless. <laughs> I might have been tired a few times. I Well, I definitely get tired, so I'm sure you did and do. <laughs> um, so John has been an integral part of our organization's history and continues to serve on the board. He's been involved in, you know, the popularization of the internet since near the beginning. He has met and interviewed and been friends with many luminaries uh, in the digital civil liberties space. Um, yeah, he's he knows a lot of cool people and knows a lot of cool stuff. So we figured I'm the zealot of the internet. <laughs> you kind of are, actually, from what I can mm -hmm. tell. Um, to that end, we usually have John, you know, at least once every couple of years, kind of give us sort of you know, usually a futurist bent talk where John will bring his considerable breadth of knowledge from a bunch of different areas relevant to the electronic frontier to sort of wax rhapsodic about where he, the internet's been and where he sees it going and just, you know, the larger sort of philosophical implications of the internet on society and, you know, and what it means for people's rights and how they live in society. So, um, and I guess, you know, I'll, um, and then I guess, um, and I've already mentioned his work with Potopia News Network. You know, he's had a number of cool jobs over the years. He helped Whole Foods Market get online back in the 90s. He's done a lot of cool stuff. But uh, John, to give an intro into John's talk for you tonight, um, well, there are certain topics that have been very much on all of our minds at the EFF Austin board recently. And sort of the idea for this talk sprung out of a kind of freewheeling conversation a lot of the board had a while back where we were just discussing the current epistemological state of the internet or basically how nobody seems to agree on what the truth is anymore or yeah, even the, the word what, dystopia comes to mind nobody agrees on what the truth is anymore or even how we could figure that out or who sources of authority to learn the truth are and you know it's easy to fall back on simple partisan reflexes of those people are stupid but you know i think most of us at the board recognize that there's something deeper and potentially far more problematic for the future of society going on here than simple partisan questions. So John decided to give us a talk that's basically going to springboard from considering the 1960s phrase, question authority, in the light of the 21st century evolution of the internet as a platform for all media. The key questions we're going to be considering in John's talk and in the discussion that follows are, are we still questioning authority or have we lost all sense of an authority for truth? What's been the impact of blogging and disruptive social media on our perception of the world? 
how do we find consensus about what's real and why would that be important? Without further ado, why don't you take it away, John? All right. Yeah. So Kevin's correct. We, we were discussing this and the question of authority thing def definitely came to mind with me. Um, and I was sort of thinking about that, meditating on it. And I came up with some ideas that I've been working on. Uh, there may be a little bit of drift from where we were in that conversation to where I am now. And I just want to say that this is a kind of a work in progress. So um, I guess I want to lower expectations. The, the, the work that I have here, the work that I've done, I consider sort of partially done. I'm still thinking about it. But I have put together a set of slides to make it a little easier on your eyes and give you something to follow. And, uh, and actually, it looks like, there we go. <clears throat> so who am I and why should you listen to me? Uh, this is a talk based on my informed perspective. And that really means it's my perspective. In other words, the experiences I've gone through, the things that I've seen, the things that I've read, uh, and certainly the contacts that I've had over the years uh, when I first uh, came onto the internet, um, I had no idea what was ahead of me, but um, I was mostly interested in the concept of online community that people could gather online and have conversations. And uh, I was uh, a big fan and advocate of uh, the whole earth uh, catalog and and coevolution quarterly the the quarterly they were publishing for several years that later became whole earth review and whole earth magazine um, I wanted to write for them I wanted to be involved with the catalog in some way and uh, I found out that they had started an online community we we called them a bulletin board system back then a BBS um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that term but really, basically, it was uh, a computer is set up and you load software on it that allows people to to post comments and then post comments on those comments. And that becomes a conversation. And of course, that's all very familiar to us now because we've experienced it in so many ways. Um, uh, through m joining the well, uh, I found my way to the Internet because not long after I joined the well, I think just after they connected it to the internet. And I also met uh, some people through, when I got on the well, I met the people who were putting together the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And then when we started something here in Austin uh, that was going to be like the initial or alpha chapter of EFF, um, I met uh, a guy named John Quarterman who was an internet consultant and who taught me uh, a lot about internet technology and also about Unix, uh, which was uh, a common platform at the time. And the well was on a Unix platform. Uh, so learning Unix uh, gave me some power I didn't have before in finding my way around. And, and the experience that I had after that led me to, uh, we started a, a company called Fringeware. And uh, our idea was that um, we could be, bring products online, products that it was hard for people to bring to market and maybe sell them online. That turned out to be a little before its time. Uh, we actually couldn't accept credit cards at the time we were talking about this. The banks wouldn't let us do it. Uh, but we did, we started a, uh, what was gonna be a catalog and became a magazine or a zine. Uh, in the terminology of the time. Um, we had both been involved with a, another zine called Boing Boing, uh, where I, we were both editors. And uh, I had also been involved with Fact Sheet 5, which was a, a zine that reviewed other zines. Um, eventually, I got involved with South by Southwest, um, initially covering it, uh, covered it. The first time I went to South by Southwest, I was covering it for Mondo 2000, which was a magazine I wrote for some. Uh, 
EFF Austin, of course, was something that started in 91 and we um, connected that with Fringeware and also with the robot group. Uh, I don't have this on my list here, but we had, uh, there were some, uh, there was an event called RoboFest where all three of us were involved in it, all three organizations. Um, I did go to work for Whole Foods Market to help them uh, do e-commerce, uh, which they did for a while. Uh, I wrote features for the Austin Chronicle, mostly about technology. I became uh, part of, actually through Bruce Sterling, who started something called the Viridian Design Movement. One thing that spun off from that was a blog called World Changing that was a pretty happening blog for a few years, and I was involved with that. And we were mostly focused on sustainability and climate change, but other things too. It was sort of, it was similar actually to the approach of the whole earth. And then uh, in the early 2000s, I got involved uh, in discussions of using this technology for politics and uh, co-edited a book called Extreme Democracy. Um, I, in the mid aughts, I led a project or I managed a project at IC Square Institute here in town called Wireless Future, which was uh, really an economic development project for wireless companies in Austin uh, to promote kind of the future of wireless. Back then, you know, you didn't have people carrying cell phones around. Um, you know, Wi-Fi existed, but but this it was very early. We actually had another project we did with Rich McKinnon, who was a former president of VFF Austin, um, called um, um, let's see, what do we call it? Austin Wireless City. And w with that project, uh, we had people walking around and recruiting various businesses to add Wi-Fi, uh, and seeing this as an approach that could. Uh, get a fairly pervasive presence for Wi-Fi throughout the city. And it was actually pretty successful. That's how uh, Wi-Fi really started to spread in Austin. Um, and then uh, I was involved with something called the Digital Convergence Initiative, which uh, led indirectly, and it's a longer story than I can tell right now, but it led indirectly to the formation of Plutopia Productions, and the big Plutopia events that we did at South by Southwest for several years. That was Maggie Duvall and Bon Davis, Derek Woodgate and I um, had that as a company where we were gonna do those kinds of uh, uh, like big events uh, for a while, but we, uh, we, we didn't sustain it very long. Those big events turned out to be very expensive events. Um, and um, overall, just throughout my life, I've been influenced a lot by pop culture. Some people are, you know, will say that they've read the classics and that they're steeped in, um, in, in an academic path that's fairly traditional, but I was very non-traditional and very much interested in, in contemporary culture. And also, I became interested in strategic foresight. Uh, futurist thinking, and uh, also I was influenced by a Buddhist practice, which I think kind of comes into the thinking behind this presentation. So I'm going to start by mentioning this book that I read. So we were talking about question authority was something that people were saying in the 60s, and, and uh, yeah, Timothy Leary didn't exactly coin the term, but he popularized it and people were putting bumper stickers on their car that said that and so forth. And uh, I don't know how well people thought about what it meant, but we knew that there were, there, there was a sense that there was some authority out there that was potentially oppressive and, and was making decisions that we didn't completely agree with and starting wars. And, you know, I mean, obviously the, uh, I was a hippie back then, and, and a bunch of us were uh, uh, brought up through an era where we were protesting the Vietnam War, but we were protesting a lot of other things too. And part of it was we were just protesting what we referred to as the establishment, that we protested without any deep understanding of what we were protesting. But 
we 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 just had the sense that something wasn't working and that kind of uh, uh, dissent can be weaponized which i think we'll get to later um, but there was a book that I found out about through a professor named Rod Bell, who taught a government course at, at UT. Um, I was in his class and he talked a lot about this book, The Social Construction of Reality by uh, Berger and Luckman. And uh, I'm not gonna get into this book or explain exactly what it was about. You see a little text there that uh, is actually from Wikipedia that kind of explains what the book was about. but. The main point here is uh, it was a very obvious thing at the time. Yes, reality is a product of consensus. It's socially constructed. Uh, the way that we see reality kind of comes out of our collective imagination. And that's an important, that was, a, that was an important insight for me, but I think that's an important insight broadly for everybody to learn and share that, that, what we think of as established, what we think of as real, uh, is constantly emerging from a collective consensus about what's real. And that's really become a big deal lately, and we'll get to that. Um, I want to start now by talking about uh, the role of media. Um, having to move these pictures around here. So, Media uh, collectively refers to all the broadcasting and publishing and now the internet uh, concerns. And uh, collective communication really, which, which is what the media, the, inter, the media represents is a kind of collective communication uh, originally or in the mass media area, era, very top down. It drives our consensus about what's real. Uh, or it did for a long time anyway. So, so you know, you had mass media, mass communication, uh, sort of facilitating and supporting the distribution of concepts, ideas, beliefs, and social models that we were all sort of carrying around in our heads. And governments and political organizations also learned in the era of mass media to leverage media to create systems of belief that worked for them and to catalyze social norms. Now it's important, I wanna mention here because we're gonna come back to this later, it's important to see another thing that has, that we've seen throughout the evolution of media and that's, this comes from Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1917, but he talked about the suspension of disbelief. And that is when you're, when you're let's say you're reading a fictional work you suspend your disbelief in, a, in order to really get into the fiction. So we start to kind of accept fictions. We accept perceptions of reality that people have dreamed up that they've conveyed to us through books or writings or movies or whatever. And uh, the fact that, that we learn to suspend our disbelief, I think is kind of relevant to where we are now. And I'm going to come back around to that. Um, but first, I want to talk about how the internet works as a uh, platform for media and the, the history of media being from spoken word initially to printed word to published word from images uh, in a cave to to published images. Um, and then, you know, over time, this evolves into mass media. The printing press is sort of like a first way to, to distribute mass media, but eventually we have like radio, television, film. And uh, through the era of mass media of the last century, we had a very scarce means of production and that, that limits the sources of media. And given those limited sources that are sort of sending media out to be distributed broadly, you could, vet media and control the messages that were being carried through media. And I think we all understand that pretty well now. And, and we know that back then, um, 
the messages coming through media and especially what we referred to as news was heavily vetted and managed and fact checked. Now, as an interim between the era of mass media and uh, the internet, personal computers popped up and we had something like called desktop publishing where uh, a small operator, somebody without that much money could actually create a publication on a personal computer, which was relatively low cost and get that printed and distributed. And I mentioned zines earlier. That's where zines came from. You had people who had always wanted to be involved with a magazine and suddenly they could just make their own magazine. So there were suddenly a bunch of zines popping up all over the place. And that was a first move in a direction of a sort of like uh, fragmentation of media uh, uh, conception and distri distribution. And then the internet comes along and changes everything. Uh, the World Wide Web starts with a page model that's very much like traditional publishing, but it's got something called hypertext. And hypertext is very revolutionary. You can like embed a link in some text and have it linked to other text. So again, the internet changes everything. So you've got the low cost of publishing. Uh, eventually there's a higher cost of gaining attention. And we see that now. But the other thing that happened uh, as the internet started to appear and evolve was it activated and enabled fringes, like fringe thinkers, people who um, were not really connected to mainstream thinking. They had a way to, to make their, their voices be heard uh, through the internet. They might have a smaller audience, but they were able to kind of get the word out. And, uh, you know, the, the fringeware thing, the idea that we had was uh, in every little town across the country, across the world, maybe there, there are people who kind of don't think like other people do, and they can't find people who think like them locally. But on the internet, they can find communities of people who are maybe closer to their, their beliefs. So that was kind of an interesting impact of the internet that we, we saw early on. Um, and we also saw that there was, a, over time, there was a diminishing commitment to vetted sources, the kind of media sources that we had seen before. Suddenly you've got all these bloggers starting to blog. There's a balkanization of perspective and belief. And there's this great petri dish for propaganda. So the internet grew from being an R&D network, this is internet history basically, to mainstreaming over the first few years, like se first seven years of, of internet mainstreaming, which, you know, I think people commonly agree that 1993 was a turning point. The, the web appeared in 92 and was starting to be adopted in 93. And then at some point you had people actually trying to to build higher end publications online and they started creating content management systems, CMS as we refer to them. And these big content management systems, which could be big and expensive back then, were, were a way to publish content, by uh, just kind of pour content into a framework and easily publish it, uh, at least more easily than having to code every page, page by page. We also saw uh, an ascendance and evolution of virtual community, more and more people coming together online, having conversations with each other. Some communities were built around blogs and some were, were built around platforms like the well that I've already mentioned or Echo in New York or um, uh, MindVox. There were several places where people would gather and, and, and talk. Um, uh, all of this started to have an impact on media production, of course, um, especially published media. And this was kind of a going concern and there was a lot of activity around it. I was part of something called Electric Minds, which Howard Rheingold started. It was built it was very similar to the well, uh, but it was supposed to be a for-profit community. And, those of us who were involved, we would, we would write articles for it. 
And then we built discussion groups around, in my case, it was around Austin. It was a whole new way of doing things really. And there were a bunch of these things popping up. And then we had the dot-com bust in 2000. Um, there had been a lot of money going into internet company stocks. And there were a lot of advertisers who were spending a lot of money on internet publications. Um, and what they found was that they were getting an inaccurate representation of, of what their money was buying them. You say, oh, you got thousands of hits for the money that you gave us. But, you know, each one of, every internet page, the web page that loaded was a bunch of different hits. Each image was a hit, you know. So the, the hit counts were, were inflated somewhat. Advertisers started to kind of uh, question whether the internet was really, uh, or these internet companies were doing that much for them. And they were kind of backing off. And that's how the money uh, kind of started going away. And there was a concern that uh, internet companies were overvalued and eventually there was kind of a collapse uh, of internet stocks. Uh, and that was in 2000. I was in the middle of a big project with Whole Foods then that they just decided to abandon. And it was mainly because of this bust. So in, in 2000, you got a bunch of people who had been working for internet publications uh, and building technologies for the internet. And they don't have big companies around anymore willing to pay them a lot of money. And some of those people started building smaller, lighter content management systems, personal content management systems. So you have stuff like Blogger and WordPress appearing. Actually, WordPress was built by really, really young guys down in Houston. Uh, and, uh, but Blogger was... Uh, um, kind of the first big blog platform that came along. There was, uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of it. There was, oh, LiveJournal. There was also LiveJournal for people who were doing more like journals. That was um, where me and all my friends were initially. Yeah, right on. LiveJournal had a, a, a large and vibrant community. And then social networks. In the 90s, there was something called Six Degrees that kind of created a model for social network sites. Um, Six Degrees didn't survive. In fact, I think it went away in 2000. But in the same year, 2000, Rise appeared, which was a, uh, a social network for like people who wanted to do business networking. And it was created by somebody who noticed that business networking events did real well. So maybe a business networking system would do well. And incidentally, the thing that really, I think, drove an increase in interest and activity here was the fact that digital photos were starting to be a thing. And Rise was the first place I remember going to where I could see pictures of the people that I knew on the internet. You remember on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. But we found out, you know, who was a dog and who wasn't at that point. And then uh, we had Friendster appeared, which was originally supposed to be more of a dating site, but it became a kind of a more generic social network. And then uh, a guy at Google had built a social network site called Orkut. That was his first name. Uh, Orkut was rolled out and was really popular for a while. And then Facebook. Facebook had been um, mostly available to people at in various colleges, they were opening up to campuses. So they, they had a pretty slow rollout going campus by campus, but eventually they opened themselves up to everybody. I, I got read it in. Yeah, I just was, I, re I remember when it was just college campuses because I was in college at the time. Um, hmm. It was a big deal when they let it be for non-college people. It certainly was. And we had a lot of conversations about Facebook after they opened up. And every time I said, man, they've really screwed up. There's no way they'll survive this. They fixed it and survived. So look where they are now. Um, Reddit is not really a traditional social network. It's really closer to being kind of like the well, a conversation space. It was mainly a place to post links and talk about them. And um, it gathered a lot of uh, attention in mass. Um, 
And then microblogging came along. Twitter uh, famously became a big thing at South by Southwest here in Austin one year when they were promoting it heavily there and people were starting to use it, mainly to coordinate like meeting around town during South by Southwest. And that really put them on the map. And of course they just grew and grew from there. There's Tumblr. There's eventually the growth of what Bruce Sterling refers to as the stacks, which are these vertically integrated media empires like Google and Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon is who he's talking about there. And those all started becoming really, really successful. In 2007, the iPhone appears and uh, smart devices, which we sort of anticipated. I was working on Wireless Future in 2005 and we did a wireless track at South by Southwest that year. Um, and uh, part of what we were talking about was how this, this is coming, you know, eventually people are gonna be walking down the street accessing the internet through devices they're carrying with them. We weren't exactly sure how that was gonna work at that point, but, but it, you know, we could see it coming very clearly. And it's at this point when kind of everybody can get their hands on a device, when you go from those weird flip phones to having a phone that's got a screen and can show you pictures, you know, show you video. Attention was moving online at that point. And that's what people were paying attention to. Oh my God. I hope nobody here has a seizure disorder. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's see. I think I can stop that thing. I thought I could. Anyway, so attention gets really promiscuous here. Not focused much anymore. Everybody's getting pretty ADD. It's fragmented across many media. It's sold to advertisers. You become the product, your attention anyway. And of course, attention is also how you get into our hearts and minds. And it has something to do with how we construct reality. It's kind of based on what we pay attention to, what we're letting in. And you have this kind of attention cycle where you commit your, where you commit your attention is reflected in your perception of reality. And then your perception of reality affects where you put your attention. And doom scrolling is an outcome that we all are becoming very familiar with. Um, doom scrolling is a term that I think is fairly recent. I heard it within the last couple of months but it really kind of describes this act of, you know, sitting with your phone and flipping through your Facebook or Twitter feed and seeing all the really bad shit on there and kind of freaking out. I, I've actually heard doom scrolling defined as it's in its most perfect distillation, go on to our collapse on Reddit and scroll down. <laughs> so um, another dimension of this is that politics discovered social media. And originally it was, oh, we can raise money with social media. This was the Dean campaign uh, in uh, 2004, I think. Um, Howard Dean had a campaign where uh, they were pretty internet savvy, Joe Trippy especially, um, and they weren't trying to control the message as much as campaigns tend to do, which people kind of liked. But their real success and what really got people excited about what they were doing was the fact that they could hold a meetup and announce the meetup and coordinate it online and have tons of people show up and give them money. And they could also get people to give them money online. So that's when the, the potential for social media to be uh, a very effective way to raise money for political campaigns was realized. But after that, in the next, uh, you know, decade or so, there was another thing that was kind of brewing, which was more about, I call it here capturing souls. I know that's a bit of an overstatement, but really the idea here is that you're getting into people's heads. You're not just getting their money, but you're also, drilling ideas into their skulls, basically. 
Uh, and remember, I said we were going to talk about suspension of disbelief again. Through media, through all of our experience with media over time, we have learned to suspend disbelief. So it's not too much of a stretch to get into our heads and get us to suspend disbelief and actually start to believe something that if we were really thinking critically, we might not otherwise have believed. So the internet kind of becomes a real Petri dish, uh, especially in 2016. We've talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, a Petri dish for psyops and propaganda and manipulation of, of what people are thinking. And you have this whole fake news thing emerging and, and the idea of deep fakes where you can't necessarily believe even what you're seeing or what you think you're seeing. Uh, conspiracy theories and alternate realities. Uh, and the fringes are starting to gain on the mainstream, really, and they're starting to become more mainstream, uh, which is something that's been happening over time anyway. But, but really, you see that kick in now, and you, you see a, a mainstreaming of the idea that traditional media are basically corrupt and are not telling you the truth and are are carrying an agenda of some kind, um, that they're not just reporting facts, that they're not just reporting truth. Um, or as Giuliani said, truth isn't truth. So you, you then have memes, memes being, uh, I mean, originally memes is a Richard Dawkins term for packets of ideas, kind of like, like genes, you know, genes are code that carry information that allow the growth of something like uh, at some level a virus, but all of us, we grow from genes, you know, all of us here, we were like just a few genes originally and we grew and grew. Well, memes can grow and grow in a viral way too. What we hear people refer to as memes now are mostly those little like pictures with text overlay that are clever. But behind those things, what they carry with them is some either emotional content uh, or some sense of narrative that um, is more powerful than the little box would normally suggest. So memes are circulating and they are uh, possibly having an impact on people. And when I say possibly, I'm not sure. And when we get to the end, I'll, I'll talk more about not being sure. But we also have cable news and 24 seven news cycles. And this is something that uh, sort of emerged from mass media and it's become a bigger and bigger thing. Um, especially in the last like decade or so. Um, cable news has become a, a form of news that is really mostly op-ed. It switches facts with opinions. They do some factual reporting, but they're heavily um, opinionated. They're, they're, there's a lot of opinion. I mean, it's become more and more like that as, as we've gone along. And the fairness doctrine had gone away. So that's sort of the end of any requirement for this idea of fairness where you have to give, you know, in any like political contest, uh, any kind of partisan discussion, both sides have to be represented. So that opens the door for things like Rush Limbaugh, Fox News and MSNBC and things on the left too. And also this money money as free speech, which was the Citizens United thing, which basically said that uh, uh, political speech could be driven by more and more money. And um, um, that's certainly been the case, of course. That I, uh, I have been a little bit on the fence about, I would like to believe that Money doesn't necessarily drive politics 100%, but it really seems to, you know? 
other thing is that you have conspiracy theories that start to emerge from fringe thinkers. Um, question about how serious they are. I mean, you think that Alex, the people who listen to Alex Jones thinks he's really serious about what he's saying, but uh, I know that when he was in court for child support, uh, he, he was an entertainer. Uh, and that was actually uh, Rush Limbaugh's thing, too. I'm, I'm just an entertainer. Keith Oberman used to call him comedian Rush Limbaugh because of that. Uh, so these guys are supposedly entertainers, but they've brought fringe thinking into the mainstream and they're pushing it really hard. And uh, of course, you know, Q, QAnon is a, uh, somebody said the other day, and, and I think there's something to this, that you can't really call QAnon a conspiracy theory. You have to call it a cult. And there's all kinds of strategies that are coming into play now that we didn't really envision when we were saying, oh, the internet's going to be great. Uh, blogs are going to be great. Blogs mean that a bunch of different perspectives are going to be available and you'll be able to listen to all those different perspectives and you'll be able to figure out what you really think is true. You'll be able to piece together what the truth is and what the reality is. Man, we were so naive. That's really kind of not where we are right now. So now you have amplification, which is something comes out that's some wacky meme or idea and people are spreading it like, I mean, completely viral. Um, Steve Bannon described it as uh, flooding the system with shit, I think. You have heavy, heavy repetition of things that are not true. But if you keep saying it over and over again, it starts, you start to think, well, maybe that is true. You have psychological warfare techniques being deployed over the internet. Uh, psychological warfare is like influencing a target's value system, belief system, emotions, motives, reasoning, or behavior. You have people who are actually doing this kind of stuff online persistently, and it's working. So, solutions. How are we going to fix this? The the recommendations I've got here, uh, you know, I said that I don't know that this talk is fully baked and it's partly because I'm not sure that I've come up with the right solutions or enough solutions, but this is kind of what I was thinking about after going through the process of putting this outline together. Um, one is active engagement with information and misinformation. Um, if if you think if you're a critical thinker, let's make that assumption. You should be engaging with the stuff that you're hearing and seeing that doesn't represent critical thinking. And you should be modeling critical thinking. And you should be making an active contribution to sense making within your own individual networks. And an important point that I picked up recently about this from listening to a guy named Steve Hassan, who is a, he's a former Mooney who is now involved in like writing about cults and doing cult deprogramming himself. And he says, you know, you can't, if you're trying to pull somebody out of a cult or out of a belief system that uh, doesn't hold up to critical thinking, you can't really challenge them. You can't tell them that they're wrong and have any appreciable effect. But he said that it can be very effective to ask questions and ask the kind of questions that will lead them into their own critical thinking that may help them think through the things that they've been told and start to understand that they've been told things that are just crazy. So how do we turn the people we know into critical thinkers? We got to do that. And it could be that not everybody has the capacity for critical thinking. And if that's the case, what do we do about them? So this is kind of, uh, we're kind of at the end of my talk. And uh, this is something that I stumbled onto after I'd already been working on this. And it got me to kind of question some of the assumptions I had. Um, 
this uh, link here is to an article, Five Myths About Misinformation. It's about a guy from Dartmouth College, Brendan Nyan. And uh, he challenges some of these assumptions like that we are living in echo chambers. He, he says that studies actually show that people are, are looking at things outside their own frameworks and, and that it's not really common for people to be listening only to people who agree, agree with them or who they agree with. Consumption of news from dubious websites. He says it's not as widespread as, as people think it is. Uh, I think the number was like a tiny percentage, maybe 5% of people were really paying attention to those sites. Um, of course, question, how do you define dubious website? You know, oh, and by and the I, way, I've got a typo in there. I see it websites. I would also springboard on that, John, and say, well, how many of those mainstream sites that they're consuming are basically just reblogging stories from those dubious sites? That's a good point. Yeah. But the real question is whether whether people are 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 consuming um, fake news in large quantities, and he thinks not. Uh, did a propaganda campaign result in Donald Trump's election? Uh, there's a lot of us who were pretty convinced that. The Russians came in and they used their uh, tricky KGB propaganda tactics, their psychological warfare tactics to convince a bunch of people to vote for Donald Trump. But there's a lot of reasons that people voted for Donald Trump. And it probably wasn't that. That probably didn't have as much impact as we think it did. And we probably ought to rethink that and start looking at all the other things that might have driven people to do that. And some of you may say, well, what's wrong with that? I voted for Donald Trump. And, you know, sorry if I seem to be negative about Trump. Um, I am a little bit. Are there people so entrenched that they don't respond to fact checks? There was uh, a piece of information floating around that I believe was, was from a study that said that they had shown that people who are confronted with actual facts that differed from their opinions would become more entrenched in their opinions. And uh, Nihan is saying that there are other studies that sort of debunk that, that it's not really common for people to disregard fact checks, that if you actually show somebody facts that contradict a, an assumption they have, they, they are more apt to change their mind than we thought they were. And then this whole question about whether we're in a post-truth era, but that really, I mean, what does post-truth mean? I mean, we can still get a consensus. We can still agree about things. Uh, and the real question is, how do we do that? And how do we become, how do we bring everybody sort of into the same conversation. And right now we have this, this polarization that is uh, significant. So Plutopia, that's the end of my talk. And I'm just gonna mention one other thing about Plutopia, which is that we have a radio show, which Scoop and I do every Wednesday from two to four. And we'll be doing it tomorrow. And it's not talk radio, we're actually playing music. So two to four tomorrow, if you're just sitting around wondering what to listen to, you can find the link at plutopia.io. Uh, it's in the, the right sidebar. Uh, there's a link to the Plutopia radio show, which is called Radio Free Plutopia. So that was my last thing. Special thanks to Kevin Welch and EFF Austin for hosting John's talk. Follow EFF Austin at EFFAustin.org. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>